Jesus spoke to his disciples and gave them his great commission. And he said in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 28, 19, uh, 20, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This past year of 2020, as I look back and reflect, it was an eye-opening year. Leslie and I were so excited to begin this new journey that the Lord has called us to, to plant a church here in Clarksville, beginning January 8th with a Bible study. And things were, were going great until March hit the calendar and COVID-19 made its way around the globe. For the first time, we all experienced quarantine and a bit of isolation. But God continued to work in the midst of it all. And he constantly told Leslie and I to stand fast in him and continue being faithful to his call. He's like, just teach the word, serve and love our community through this pandemic. He said, through it. We did learn how to use all this, you know, great equipment, you know, technology and all that. We were even able to uh, live stream during the quarantine, which we haven't quite mastered that one yet, but we're getting there. But I will tell you this, the Lord constantly and continued to tell Leslie and I, reminding us week after week in the face of discouraging times to remain faithful to him. So we listened. And we obeyed him. Even when we had our emotional ups and downs, I mean, come on. I mean, we, we planted a fellowship during a pandemic. Who does that? How does that happen? Along with all the other things that happened in 2020. You couldn't help but to ask, why, Lord? Why now? It wasn't clear right off the bat. But as I continued to seek him through the year and asked him specifically what the vision would be for his body of Christ for 2021, our faithful Lord began to bring things to my attention little by little. And some things hit my heart with heaviness where I couldn't help but weep. And other things he gave me was strength and hope and peace. But especially in the last couple of weeks, the Lord's word became very clear to me. From the time I began seeking him till now, and the Lord gave me the word preparation. Just to give us perspective, I'll ask you guys this question. How many believe, how many do you believe that Jesus' return is very close? Okay, I do too. I believe it won't be long before the Lord calls his bride, the church, to him to be caught up with him in the clouds and be with him forever. And we as believers, we rejoice in this. We can't wait for that day. He is our hope. And oh, what an amazing day that will be for us. But my heart couldn't help but to think about the people that will be left behind. The people we know. People who we love. And the people that we assume are believers will remain here on this earth during the tribulation, family members as well left behind. All these and many more will have to make their final eternal choice to either worship the lawless one known as the Antichrist or to die for our Lord Jesus Christ. Scary thing is, I've heard it said, well, if I'm left behind, I'll know what to do. Okay. But if you're not willing to live for him now, what makes you think you will die for him then? This way of thinking, folks, is all around us. And the lost are all around. Still searching for the truth in a world full of deceit and misinformation like we have never seen in our lifetimes. There is so much work that needs to be done in our community, in our families, and with our friends knowing that the time is short 
before our Lord's coming. And we ourselves are preparing for the Lord's return, to, for him to receive us, which is good because we need to be ready. But yet with so much work to do, are you truly prepared? Are you prepared to answer the Lord? What have you done with your time? What have you done with your money? What have you done with your abilities? What have you done with your authority? Our resources. And I'm referring to the parable of the talents when he asks you, what you have done, what have you done for me and my kingdom? The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 10, says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Are you prepared to give an account to the Lord? And hear Jesus say to you, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. The truth is the Lord has given us so much, all the resources we need to live and be thankful for. Seriously, we are truly blessed. We are truly blessed. But are we using what the Lord has given us for his kingdom, for his glory? Brothers and sisters, we need to be prepared for the day is near. He's coming. Everyone kind of following me? Okay. The Lord gave me the word preparation, and I believe the Lord is stirring up his church, his body, to be ready for his use, especially in such times that we are living in now. But let's dig into the word preparation. Let's, let's find clarity and, and, and see what it means. Preparation means the action or process of making ready or being made ready for use. Now, there are two words that stick out to me in this definition. We see that there is a process. That's the first word. Process meaning a series or set activities that interact to produce a result. And this process of series or set activities happens in one's life spiritually to be made ready for use. Use is the second word, meaning to take hold or deploy something as a means of accomplishing a purpose or achievement or achieving a result. So preparation shows us we need to be prepared to reach an end result. Okay, all things are pointing to attaining a result. And the result comes from you. Do we understand what the word preparation means? I'm, I'm, you know me very well that I, I'm a repetitive guy. I like to make sure that we understand clear so as we leave, it just sticks. Okay, so you see, we all need to understand that there will be a day that, we'll, that we will all stand before Jesus and we need to be prepared to just as I, your pastor, needs to be prepared to stand before him. And I will answer him, you know, have I prepared you guys? I will stand before him and have to, to give an account. Am I, have I prepared you to stand before him? You know, this word, this very word of preparation is for me as well. I need to prepare you so you are made ready to be used by him and for him to reach an end result. So you will be able to stand before him and answer him with your results. Simple, right? As I continued to search all these things in prayer with the Lord, God had revealed to me when I asked, why now? Well, he was telling me, this is why I called you, Rob, into the ministry, into his ministry. Because the thing is, is I am wired with a military mind frame. I'm all about processes, and I'm all about results. As a chief petty officer in the Navy, our motto was, no excuses, just results. That's what we lived by. So for me, things had to make sense. Ten times out of ten, you know, that's how I rolled. If it didn't make sense, I'm starting right back from the beginning until it made perfect sense to me. I always analyzed things. I always am studying everything, even when I attended church. I look at every intricate detail, how everything is run, 
I'll even go and ask the pastor questions, not to be rude or, or anything, but to understand his heart and his calling, not just to be a pastor, but to understand the calling. It's just how my brain functions. But anyways, but being in the Navy and moving every three years, I have visited many other churches before. And what never made sense to me in the church is why has the church growth been made the sole responsibility of the pastor? I've seen in so many different churches, and I won't mention names, but I see the emphasis is placed on how can we draw people into the church doors, whether by having multiple programs and programs for programs or entertaining the audience with the big stage production with the smoke and the lights and the gigantic screens or by having the greatest Christmas show with people hanging from the ceiling playing drums like a circus just like they did in the synagogues and the feast, right? I'm just kidding. But the list goes on and on. All the emphasis is placed on how do we get people into the doors. And I, I'm exhausted just thinking about it. Well, that is not the Great Commission. It is not. And let me explain first what the pastor is called to do. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. The Apostle Paul gives us a clear description of what the pastor is for. He says that the pastor is for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry. And it continues by telling us that we are to bring you to the fullness of Christ, which means to grow. There's, there needs to be growth in your life and for to, to bring you into maturity in Christ. So I'm, I'm called to equip you for the work of ministry that our Lord has called you to do. I'll say it again. I'm called as your pastor to equip you for the ministry that our Lord has called you to do. And there is a lot of work to be done. I always tell people, you can't pour into other lives from an empty cup. So as the Lord pours in my cup, which is what my calling is, you know, I'm called to pour into your cups so that you are equipped for the work of ministry, which means you are supposed to Turn around and be pouring out into other cups. Amen? Amen? This is why we assemble together as a body of Christ here. To learn his word and to understand how it applies it, how to apply it in your life. And to be able to turn around, therefore, and share it through a life lived or any circumstance that faces you. But as I was saying before, when I, when I see this primary focus coming from a pastor or his staff, how to draw people into the building doors for the sake of numbers or growth, you know, because it's all about numbers sometimes, I would have to say that this is just backwards. It is backwards. Because we see in this scripture where Jesus demonstrated to us what we are to do and even told us clear as day, we are to go out to the people right where they are and preach the gospel and go make disciples. So why are a lot of what we see today in churches backwards? Because simply put, they're not preparing the believers, which is hindering the work of the ministry of the Lord. The process in preparation is what we're missing here. And it needs to happen for one to be made ready for his use. Without the process, how can we as vessels be truly prepared to be used by the Lord to fulfill the main thing that he calls us to do, his commission? Also, how can we be prepared to give an account to the Lord when we are face to face with him if we're not taught? Do you see what I'm saying? So as the Lord showed me these things, I was like, yeah, I totally get it. <laughs> it makes total sense to me, Lord, and here's why. How many veterans do I have in here or active? Okay. In the military, like I said, we're all about processes and results. And one of the most important processes, and it's pretty lengthy, is when someone joins the military. 
Now, when one decides to join, now take it from me, I did recruiting for 16 years. I got to hear every, why people are uh, wanting to join. And the main consensus is, is that they join to better their situation, to better their lives, or because they believed deeply in a cause. So they enter into an agreement to serve their country in the Navy. But then what happens next is they are sent to a basic training where they go through a process to transition them from a civilian to a sailor. They train hard in all life and death situations, especially emphasizing the necessity of working together in unity and to hold each other up while holding each other accountable. And after their rigorous trials, tribulations, and tests at basic training and their schools, they are sent out to the fleet to serve. There is a process that occurs. And I'm telling you that there is this type of process in the life of the believer that is rarely, rarely happening. And the Lord commands us to do this very thing. When we come to the Lord, here's a good parallel. When we come to the Lord, we came to Him because we believed in Him. And we want to be secure in our eternal direction. To be in a relationship with God, you know, and just be right with Him. So we enter into salvation. We receive Jesus Christ into our hearts. We believe in Him. And then we enter into this new covenant with our Lord. But then, from there, the transition should begin. And it begins where our old self is to learn and begin transforming into a new creation. There is a renewing of our minds that needs to be taken place. Through his word, learning our foundational beliefs of who and what and why we believe. We need to see the spiritual life and death lessons that's written in the word. And to learn how to walk in the Holy Spirit. And learning this straight. From his word. This is sort of like our basic training, but it is called discipleship. And this is what Jesus has called us to do. He says, make disciples. So what is discipleship? Discipleship is the process. Wait a minute. Whoa. Process. Here's that word again. Discipleship is the process of a more seasoned believer coming alongside a new believer to help them grow spiritually. How? By studying in God's word the fundamental beliefs and responsibilities of a disciple for their new life and spiritual growth. Now, I just want to ask, I just want to ask everybody, how many of us have been discipled? Raise your hand. Okay, not too many of us. Some of us have, but not too many. So why do you think that is? Because a lot of churches today, they just don't do it. There's all these other programs emphasized, but this is the most important one that's neglected. In a lot of churches, people have become very accustomed to learn everything from the pastor. You're only taught to, to be dependent on the pastor. Every Sunday morning, going to church, Right? Getting fed and fed and fed while becoming idle in the ministry and work and spiritually obese. So if the process isn't happening, how are you going to fulfill the Lord's commission individually? And if you have not been discipled, how can you then turn around and disciple another? This is a problem. Jesus calls us to go and make disciples. And this is a command from Jesus we don't get to pick and choose what commands we will obey. No, it doesn't work that way. We either obey his commands or we disobey him. The Apostle Paul taught this to Timothy, who he mentored in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 2. And he says, And then the things that you have heard from me, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Basically, what he's saying is, what I have taught you, commit these teachings to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also. Loved ones, every one of us are commissioned to do this. Nothing stops with us. Nothing stops after Sunday church. 
Nothing stops after Wednesday evening Bible study. We are commissioned to serve and obey the Lord's commands, just like an officer in the military, right? As soon as they are trained up, they are commissioned for service. Same goes with the ship. When it's built and the crew is ready and trained up, it is commissioned for service. And we are to go out and make disciples of all nations. There is this process of discipleship that is very important, a very important part of preparation. Now, I'm going to go a little further. Now, when a sailor is sent out, he typically goes to a ship, right? It's common sense. Popeye goes on a ship to serve. But let's talk about the ship. Now, when I left basic training and my school, I reported to the USS Normandy. It's, a, it's an Aegis cruiser out of Norfolk, Virginia. And this ship, when I walked up, it was so amazing. It was huge. It was like walking to you know, like a Star Wars movie, you're seeing this ginormous ship, right? I'm like, this is a cool place to work. There are about 300 crew members and about 30 officers. And the ship is made up of many different jobs from engineering, communications, electricians, firefighters, combat operations, navigation, food service, like in the galley. I mean, and the list goes on. It's a little city. And all these jobs play an important role in the ship's readiness. Without the crew's training and preparedness, the ship would be idle, useless, or as we call it in the Navy, dead in water. Everyone had to be trained up and be ready to go. Then the ship can move and be as powerful and ready for use as it should be. And this is very familiar with the, uh, similar to the body of Christ. Everyone plays a vital role in the body according to God's call in their lives. No matter what the size of fellowship it is, everyone has a part. We all serve the head of the body, which is Jesus. It is under his command that we serve. And everyone has gifts of the Holy Spirit, very unique, special gifts to, to individuals. And everybody has unique callings that God calls you to serve in, in the body. We all have different ways to preach. We all have different ways to teach. We have all different ways to disciple. We have diversity. We have different ways of doing things, but when we all come together to serve, there is power in this to accomplish so much more that the Lord wants to work through us. But it begins with discipleship. It is very vital for everyone's preparation. It is our basic training. And this goes right together with his other command, right? Our mission, where discipleship is like the co-mission. Our mission is given to us in Mark chapter 16, when Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go out and preach. Well, people look at the word preach and they're like, Oh, man, I'm not a preacher, you know. That's, do I have to be like John the Baptist standing out there and going, repent? No, it's not. It means that we need to proclaim, to announce, to make known. We are to make Jesus known to every, it says creature, but I'll tell you in English, to everybody, everybody we come across. We cannot just go out, preach the gospel, People are saved and then just leave the people right where they're at, try to figure things out. Or say, hey, now you need to go find a church so you can depend on the pastor. No. That is not the Lord's commission. We are to go share the gospel and when one receives, we are to take them in and disciple them. How many people in this room have led someone to the Lord through the sinner's prayer? Let me know. Raise your hand. Okay. How many know the sinner's prayer? I can say it up, okay. <laughs> My wife's like, how many of us in this room felt a little awkward after giving it? Like, what's next? Right? Like, oh, our only next thought was, oh, you, you need to come to church. Right? Well, yeah, but that's not enough. It's not enough for them to continue in the new relationship with Jesus. We all know that right off the bat, there's someone right now that wants to take them out. 
or to remove that seed. You know, remember the parable of the four soils? You know, we need that seed to be planted where it grows roots. So our next thought should be to disciple this person. But since I asked the question about the sinner's prayer, how many people have shared the gospel with somebody? Right? Okay. How many of us have shared the gospel with someone in the last six months? How many, how about the last year, the last 12 months? How many of us are not sure what to do? Therefore, you know, we tend to lack the confidence to even try. Right? Unless it falls in your lap. Those are the greatest ones when it just, you know, God brings that person to you, you know, and it, you just share the gospel they receive, and that's awesome. I think, I think you, Carlos shared with me of one of your friends that would just go out to the supermarket and, and in the midst of the conversation, do you know God? There's boldness in that. And the person receiving, there's power in that. There's so much to learn just with that little, that little statement. But I completely understand if you don't feel prepared or you're not confident. No one ever wants to do something that they're not ready for, let alone with any, without any preparation. The thing is, if the process is not being acted upon, then his great commission becomes hindered in our own lives. And this is what is happening in the church today. And it's sad to say it, but it's true. I'm going to say it again. If we're not discipling new believers, then how can they go out and preach the gospel? And if we're not going out and sharing the gospel, how do we make disciples? I mean, this goes hand in hand. It's a crazy, crazy thing that happens. Now, initially, when I was praying and seeking the Lord for a vision, for us as a fellowship, asking, how can we impact our community for you, Lord? God made me realize that his church, his, his sheep, and I'm not just saying just this vine, but his believers are not properly prepared. So how can his commission move through these crazy times if parts of the body, of his body, are not able to move? as they're supposed to move. You ever stand, in, you know, stand on a foot that has fallen asleep or a leg? Think about that. The Lord is trying to move his body and his arm and both his legs are asleep. Makes it pretty hard for him to move click quickly with readiness, just like it is for us. And as your pastor, how can I expect you to go out if you're not equipped or prepared to do the Lord's work? In my eyes, I would be failing you. And I have to give an account for that. So the Lord has made it clear that this year, 2021, we need to be made ready for his use. Once we are made ready and prepared, clarity, wisdom, ideas, callings, burdens, direction will begin to happen within you, right? And therefore, the body begins to move, and the work of the ministry happens, just like we all experienced this past December when we had the opportunity to stand in the gap for our kids in our city who needed clothes for the winter. None of this came to surface until the Lord's burden was placed on the heart of our fellow brother and sisters, Carlos and Michelle, and they brought it to the table, and we prayed on it, saw the Lord in it, and the fellowship stepped in big time, big time, and moved. And through God's provision, we were able to make an impact to the least of these. It was not my idea, but I am so beyond blessed to be a part of the work that came from our fellowship where our God was glorified and his work was done. It was beautiful. And in order for us to move forward for the kingdom of heaven, we need to be prepared to preach and prepared to disciple. I'm going to say preach, to make Jesus known and prepared to disciple as we prepare ourselves for his return. The greatest gift ever given to us by God is the, how he equipped us with the power of the Holy Spirit that is upon us. Jesus tells us in John 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance 
all things that I have said to you. And Jesus also tells us that the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16 uh, will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit will work in us and through us, coming alongside our preparedness. And he'll give us the power and gifts to do the will of Jesus as God has called you to. Now, the part when I was saying that there was a bit of heaviness, you know, where I weeped, where things got heavy, is when the Lord told me, there will be many who will reject me. Many rejected him while he was here on this earth. And many rejected him, those who were even witnessing him on the cross. The same heart of mankind that was there back then is the same heart of mankind that is here today. I couldn't help but weep because we know this and it is clearly seen today. But then the Lord comforted me and gave me peace and reminded me, and I'm reminding you, we just need to be faithful to him and plant his seed. We only need to trust in him with the results. So 2021 is the year of preparation. And I plan to organize, this is my, what, my, what my heart is, to, design, to organize a discipleship class and teach you how to disciple. But you need to understand the fundamentals of discipleship, you know, and what we believe. That way, when you turn around, you can explain it to them. So you can impact a new believer for the Lord. Trust me, it's an amazing experience. And you will have the resources that you will need to help you. And after we complete the first discipleship class, and I'm probably going to do it by Zoom, uh, we will plan the next class where one of you can step up and teach and lead it. And then we will continue in on this, assuring the process is always available, whether in the class or you individually. I remember um, when I first became a Christian, uh, my friend took me to his church, right? And that was what they did. You get saved and, hey, come to my church. And I went to his church with him. I'm the strange guy. I was the new guy. I'm just so I'm a little bit quiet. And the pastor's son, his name was Tim Kazar. I barely even know him. Just met him and all that. He felt the Lord put on his heart to disciple me. He doesn't even know me. And he came and goes, hey. And the way he always talked was, hey. You know, I had this. I said, hi, how's it going? He goes, you ever thought about discipleship? Have you ever done a job? I'm like, what is that? What is what do you mean discipleship? I don't even, what do you, what's a disciple? You know, that kind of thing. And he explained it to me. He goes, yeah, we'll just get together. You know, I'm going to give you a little bit of homework where you can read, just answer these questions. And we're going to get together and we're going to discuss them. I said, sure. I'll tell you what, guys. That was the most impactful thing that has ever happened in my life. If he had not stepped in and did that, I would have been right back where I was, you know, where God found me. I would have been right in the, in the, in the gutter. <laughs> so it's exactly what I needed. I also believe we need to learn how to preach the gospel so you have a, a comfortable foundation to be able to have a conversation with someone as the Holy Spirit prompts you. How many times have, be honest, have you felt the Lord saying, I need to talk to that person, but you, you just were so like, <laughs> and just kind of went the other way? How many of us have done that? Okay. So I'm looking at ways that we can teach just some basics to give us a foundation. And I think it's important because even in recruiting, none of us, a lot of those guys who come from the fleet into recruiting, they're introverts. You know, they don't know how to interact with people. But when you rehearse and you practice with them and you sit with them, and, and then they tend to be able to go, hey, every situation becomes very similar. You're going to hear a lot of the similar things of this world, this culture that will be thrown at you. But the more that you're out there sharing the gospel or making Jesus known, it's going to be able, the Lord's going to, that's when the Holy Spirit in those moments are going to step in. When I got saved, I thought I, Mr. Atheistic Mind, I thought I had all the answer or questions for him that will stumble them. And the Holy Spirit answered every one of them. And I stood there just like, that was the power of the Holy Spirit. So, I think it's important if we, we can figure out ways to teach 
um, how to preach, it'll get us out of our comfort zone of not doing it. We'll always have something, a format or something in our minds that we can stand and go back on when we start sharing. And I believe this foundation will help us get out of that, that zone to be able to make Jesus known. These basic tools will remain with this fellowship. It's my job, it's my call to equip you guys to go, so you're able to go before our Lord Jesus Christ and give an account for what you have done for his kingdom. Because you know what? We're not standing together up there on the beam seat. We're not going to be like, hey, Divine Fellowship, come on up here. You know, let's see what you do. Oh, 2020. Yeah, you guys did this. No. It's going to be you and Jesus. And guess what? He knows all the truth. He's seen it all. He knows. And you're going to have to answer. We all are. Jesus commissioned us for his use with two great commands. Go into the world and preach the gospel to everyone. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. You teach them everything that the Lord has taught you. And you teach by demonstration. You teach by living it out as his disciples. You're a reflection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this year will be our year that we act. We will be made ready for his use. We need to be. And I will close with this, just so we never forget, that none of this can happen without Jesus at the center of it all. He will lead us. He will direct us in our lives. And as a fellowship, he will be the center of us, this fellowship. It is, it is here where we began, and it is here that we will remain focused on in 2021. John chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So we will abide in Jesus in this time of preparation through the power of the Holy Spirit. We as Christians will shine our light this year and the flame of the Holy Spirit will ignite in our hearts this year. Let it be known, God is with us. We don't see what the Lord has. We don't see what this world has, but we can already see that this is gonna be some trying times and he's calling us, guys, be prepared. I'm coming, I'm coming, but we, we have our races to finish, and so we're going to finish strong, amen? Amen, let's pray.